Thank you for joining the Judaism Demystified podcast. Rabbi Wiles, if you can first tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your organization. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure and honor. Big fan of you guys uh, and this podcast. So I, uh, from Forest Hills, Queens, uh, born and bred. And uh, yeah. all of us. Same here, yeah. Well, Forest Hills? Yeah. yeah. I'm Kew Gardens. He's Forest Hills. Yeah. I lived yeah. on Exeter Street, off uh, next to Austin Street. No, you're on the wrong side of the boulevard. Uh, I'm from okay. uh, well, then we're Lansman, you know? That's a Ashkenazic term when you see yeah. your old buddies from the old country. <laughs> anyway, so Forest Hills, Queens, I, um, uh, I studied at Yeshiva University. Um, I was also originally planning on going into law, international law. I have a degree in law and a degree in international affairs and kind of got sidetracked into uh, the rabbinate via Jewish outreach. And I've devoted the last more than 25 years of my life to reaching out to our less affiliated Jewish brothers and sisters, primarily through Manhattan Jewish Experience, MJE, which I started 24 years ago. It's been a great ride. And um, besides all of the you know, uh, Jewish lives that we have inspired uh, and re-engaged, reignited, I guess. Um, it also gives me a wonderful platform to engage people intellectually and spiritually, which is really what I love to do. So that's just a little about me, but enough about me. <laughs> so um, what we really wanted to get into, because this is your specialty, um, which is Kiruv, um, we wanted to know what you feel are the strengths and weaknesses that were the pitfalls of Kiruv and what it is we can do to improve uh, Kiruv. Because obviously, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but it's majority of Jews are abandoning Judaism. And the reason why we started our podcast is because, you know, the first episode we had with Rabbi Joshua Maruf, we discussed that why is it that Jews are are our Einsteins, the brilliant minds of Judaism, the smartest people in the room are abandoning Judaism. They don't find it compelling. Why is that? And, you know, the key of organizations, it seems to be catered more towards the low hanging fruit. We want to kind of appeal to the um, academic, the post-religious Jew who finds Judaism to be a, a not a chachma and not, not something that is, um, you know, in, intriguing, not something that is compelling. Intellectually so, vibrant. Right. Mainly because, for for example, they they see Judaism as arcane or superstitious or kind of like you know doesn't relate to the modern world, the age of skepticism and reason, uh, and atheism. So we felt it was important to start a podcast about this, um, mm -hmm. and we wanted to ask you, you know, from your perspective and your experience, what do you feel is something we can do to kind of improve um, the Kira movement as a whole? So so I'm gonna. It's a great question, um, and Kola to you guys for having these conversations. They're important. Uh, you use the word abandoning. How many Jews are abandoning? So my population, um, which is the, the the group of young Jews we're running after at MGE to sort of engage in Jewish life. I'm going to say running after, but engage in Jewish life. I, I, I can't really use the word abandon, like they've abandoned Judaism, because that implies that at some point they were engaged in Judaism, they were educated in Judaism, they were informed yeah. even of the very, very basics. They were never. They have a Hebrew school education, which consisted of uh, an hour or two, one, two day, one or two, maybe three days a week of school after school, which were taught, you know, respectively, I'll say it nicely, by people who didn't really know very much about Judaism themselves. And <laughs> we're, certainly, we're certainly not experts at being able to inspire and turn on kids. And then by the time they were 12 or 13, they were bar bat mitzvah out of Judaism. So to say that 80%, at least 80% of our Jewish brothers and sisters here in the United States, this is their experience. High holidays, Passover Seder, a little Hanukkah candle lighting, and graduation at their bar and bat mitzvahs. That to me is, I can't consider a Jew like that who doesn't continue with Judaism to have abandoned Judaism. They haven't actually been introduced to it, in my opinion. Fair point. So, Excellent point. So, that, so that, that's that's the group, uh, you know, I'm engaged with. That's the group I'm dealing with. Um, you know, if, if you want me to comment on why I think people raised like you and I were raised. I was raised in the Orthodox community. I know you guys were. I'm more Ashkenaz, you guys more Sephardi. It doesn't matter. We were raised, I think, with Judaism being presented to us in a serious way. I'm not saying the best way but in a serious way. And therefore, if, if we didn't keep it or our friends who went to Yeshiva day school with us didn't keep it, then I think you could use the word, I guess, abandon on some level. 
you know, wh which one would you, wh which population would you like me to comment on? Uh, well, you can start with your population and what it is that, you know, you feel turns them towards Judaism. Because I feel like what I, I feel like with, with a Kirov world, I always felt like it was Haredi or Haredi light right. in the approach. And there are certain things that are off the table, certain discussions that, that they try to avoid. Um, and there's a lot of gimmicks involved as well in some of them. So I, I want to understand more about what you do with your crowd, because you obviously have a different audience than the ones that I'm referring to. I'm thinking about, say, Asha Torah. Right. So, I mean, there are different approaches. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my approach. My approach is that there's no one size that fits all. When you go into a classroom and there are 20 students sitting there, uh, for argument's sake, eight or nine of them are going to be more intellectually slash rationally oriented. And they're looking for convincing, compelling arguments for A, the existence of God, B, the divinity of the Torah, C, the relevance of Torah and mitzvot in their lives. A whole other group could care less about that. They are sort of like a little more the grungy spiritual types that are very much turned, are very turned on you know, they'll be impressed intellectually if you make a good argument for Judaism, but it's not going to move them one way or the other because that's not that's not what resonates with them. What resonates with them inspiration. is, is, is insp well, it's inspiration. Slash, I think everyone wants inspiration, but this group wants inspiration slash spirituality. Now, whatever that means, but the, they want to hear like spiritual wisdom. And the fact that it makes a logical argument, you know, you make a logical thing. That's nice. That's very nice. But that's not going to do it for them one way or the other. So what I try to do is I try as best as I can as a teacher. And we have a, we have a staff. We have 18 people on MGE staff, nine part-time, nine full-time. There's four other rabbis besides me and a number of excellent female uh, Torah educators. And, you know, and I, and I teach them. I, I've been mentoring a lot of my staff for years is that, you have to present different approaches because if you present one approach and, you know, let's say the purely rational, let's call it my Modian approach, then it will resonate hopefully with the people that are more rationally oriented. And hopefully that'll be very inspiring intellectually for them. The other group will, will just sit there and they'll, 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 they won't come back. Now, what do you do if you don't really believe in the other approach? <laughs> At least what we can say is that you know, and I believe in being intellectually honest, like whatever mitzvah I'm talking about, whatever Jewish philosophical idea I'm talking about, I will try to offer different perspectives. And sometimes I won't even tell people which one I like or which one resonates with me. I will say, here's the Rambam, Maimonides, here's the Ramban, Nachmanides. Often they agree, often they disagree. One can be more rational. We all know who that is, and one can be more mystical. We know who that is. Although Ramban is very Nachmanides is very rational in many places. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. But he does, you know, when he goes into quote unquote sod, he's getting into the world of Kabbalah. He was clearly a Kabbalist. Yes. Correct. Correct. So, um, so it really depends. That's why, like, now I personally, if you're asking where I am personally, you know, it depends on the issue. Some issues I like the more rational explanation, and some other issues the rational explanation is not sort of satisfying to me. So I will dip into a little more Kabbalah and Hasidus because that resonates a little more with me. But I think as a outreach professional, you really you want to be true to your own feelings and your own intellectual ideas and what's true, what you think is actually true. But you could always say that while this idea does not resonate with me personally, and I actually have issues with it. I still want to share it with you. And the reason I do that is because I don't want to leave other people out. I want to make sure that as many of the people sitting before me get something out of this and not feel like, oh, this is Judaism. And therefore, and it's not resonating with me. I guess Judaism doesn't resonate with me. Uh -huh. I want to provide them with a, um, you know, so if I'm talking about kashrut, okay, let's give an example. If I'm, I'm speaking about keeping kosher. So I think there are great rational reasons for keeping kosher. The disciplinary approach, which I think you can learn out from the Rambam and the Moran of Vuchim. Um, you, um, but, but, you know, that, but I also share you are what you eat approach, which is a little more of a, um, a mystical, you know, idea that somehow what we eat can affect our disposition and personality. There seems to be, uh, evidence in 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 some of the writings of Kabbalah, and it, it seems like in modern day nutritionists are starting to see relationship between the things that we consume 
and the way not only we behave, but the way we are oriented towards the world. I wouldn't say there's hard evidence of that, but it seems to be the way certain nutritionists are going today. So, um, but what I would love to see, I would just love to, okay, so in the, in, the, in the less observant world, you know, the world I'm running after and chasing less affiliated Jews, I just want to see Judaism presented for the profound inspirational force that it is. And unfortunately, it has not been presented that way to, to most of our Jewish brothers and sisters. It's been presented as a very blah, not terribly inspirational, not terribly relevant yes. or rational. It's like, you know, if you are a, a nostalgic, you know, kind of superstitious yeah. kind of person, then you'll follow your religion. Yeah, correct. Absolutely right. And I think it's yeah, not please. even in the, in the Kirov world. I think even in the yeshiva world, like... Um, the the syllabus of of what we actually study, it's like it should be more like college where you could you should learn about um, different subjects that you know. Let's say for example, you learn Chovot Halevavot, and you learn about just I don't even think we were ever taught about like philosophy of what, what God is and what God is not. Fundamentals. Fundamental. Fundamentals. What That's are we really the problem? Oh, so this is the major. I, you know, I put four kids through Jewish day schools, and I have to tell you, what you're both saying is a massive, massive issue, and it's one of the reasons, in my opinion, why not enough yeshiva-educated kids stick with it, Be 100%. because they they've been presented certain aspects of Torah, primarily Gemara, Mishnah, Gemara, which are very important, and I would never advocate removing them from the curriculum. But you just mentioned Chavos Lavavos. How many yeshiva students ever even heard or you know studied that book? And that right. book is, is is a game changer for a lot of people. How many people have studied the Ramchal, the more rational you know books he's written, the more mystical? It's not in there. Like I, I'm, I don't want to get too personal, but I, I've literally dealt with this for, with each of my four children. I've spoken to their teachers. I've spoken to the principals, and I don't get how in the 21st century, the curriculum is so small in yeshiva day schools. It's unbelievable. It's extremely narrow. It's extremely narrow. So why do you think that is? Do you think that they're afraid of having certain conversations or maybe because they're not capable of it? A, that's number one. People are afraid, and I've spoken to rabbis, they're afraid that they're going to get a very smart 10th or 11th grade kid who's going to ask a very difficult philosophical question they're not going to have a good answer for. B, we are not trained. We are not trained to answer those questions because we're not schooled enough in those texts. And, 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 and therefore, you don't have confident teachers in these areas that they would. Now, there's a third reason, which is that it's taking away from like what people perceive as the meat and potatoes of Torah Judaism, which is, you know, Halacha, Mishnah, Gemara, you know, Shas, Poskim, Rishonim, and all that. And and but you know what percentage that's working for? Very little. I mean, it, it's it you know it's the top twenty percent of every school. It's the top twenty percent. My kids went to MTA. I just went to TABC. My oh, I also went to MTA. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so it's like so you know, and you know it's the A and B sheer that are a little more serious about it, and the CD. But like even within the A and B, so. I have one one of my son, I mean all of my kids are very into machshava and I've had to supplement because they don't they don't get it from school and they've done it on their own my my son who's 20 who's learning in yeshiva um you know he he spent 10th 11th 12th grade learning certain philosophical sfarim and a lot of people and and he's the proof when people say oh they're too young to appreciate these things it's nonsense these kids are smart and if you're a good teacher, you can explain anything. Correct. If you could explain, if you could explain a difficult Gemara and a Machlokas, Rashi and Tosvos on a complicated sugya in Shas, then if you have if you're a decent teacher, you can explain issues about God's existence, God's unity and oneness and divinity of the Torah, not divinity of the Torah. You can get into these things, but people are nervous about it. I'll tell you something with my own kids, my kid, I have a nine-year-old son, even when he was younger, I remember. He asked me about God, like, what is God? How is he not like, is, can we see him? Can we, you know, how, how do we know he exists if, if we can't see him? So and I was shocked that he asked the question. And, and I said, I said, okay, are you breathing right now? What is that? It's oxygen. I said, do you see it? No. So how do you know it's there? It's obviously there. 
uh, gravity, for example, these are, these are things that are, there are forces within the world that Hashem placed in the world to prove to us that you don't need to actually see him, see it to understand that it's there. Right, we have to develop uh, their abstract right, thought. Just developing their abstract thought. And I think yeah. the problem, like, for example, we're taught Rashi, right, with uh, with Humash from a young age. And we see everything through the prism of of, uh, of Midrash, which is not, not it's, it's not, these are, you know, didactic kind of uh, lessons. And what we're not explaining to them what the midrash actually means because that was the original method of learning midrash is to understand the riddles that they're teaching us. So, for example, very recently, I was teaching my son. Um, we we're discussing um, one of you we were watching Aleph Beta, uh, Rabbi David Foreman, who's actually going to be on our podcast. Oh, he's amazing. Uh, he's amazing. He's and amazing. and we were talking about the the hand of Miriam. He did. A, he was talking about the midrash, the hand of Miriam, and and uh, sorry, of uh, Bat Paro. Right, that she sticks her hand out and it's it's stretched out, and what does that mean? And and I I asked my son, I said, what do you think the midrash is trying to tell us? That's a question they don't ask in yeshiva. Right, you know? it's read as if it's just fact. stating a fact. Yes, mm. and it's like, and and this is midrash. This is something that's that's no, and that's that's a turnoff because then a kid grows up. You know, it's okay when they're five or six to hear that midrash. It's sweet, but when they're fifteen or sixteen and it's still being taught as though it's some sort of literal. Yes. You know the Rambam. The Rambam said, I think this. Uh, I think in the Shemona Prakim, that anyone who reads every medrash literally is a fool, and anyone who reads every medrash figuratively is a kofar. <laughs> so I want you to know. I, I I spoke with a number of my teachers, and I and I asked them this question. When I went to yeshiva, just like you guys are sharing, no one really explained which medrash should be read figuratively, which should be read and and explain. And maybe there's a debate on that. But how do you tell? How do you know? Like, how do you? And they all said the same thing. I asked Rav Shechter at Yeshiva University, where I studied, uh, Rav Herschel Shechter. I asked this to Rav Nevin Self Shlita, a great rabbi in Eretz Yisrael. I asked this to, and they all said, and my, my rabbi, Rabbi Grimblad, was a great a scholar and great philosopher, too. They all said the same thing. They danced around the same answer, which was that you develop a sensitivity for the language of Chazal. And after learning a certain amount of time, you can start trying to to get when Chazal were, like you said, a riddle, they, they're, 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 it's a metaphor. And because if you just take it literally, then you're missing the whole point of the metaphor. You're not delving into what that extension of, of you know, Paro's daughter's hand, what, what, what are the rabbis, what are the sages in the Medrash trying to teach with that riddle? Because if you say it's literally, oh, it's just that she had a really long arm. Or Moshe Rabbeinu. No, it's not her arm was long. It's that her arm magically stretched out. Stretched out, right, whatever. She was an elastic yeah, she couldn't reach, so her so yeah. the miracle happened, and her arm stretched out. That's that. That was the midrash. And right, the whole so, thing, the whole thing is about the, the the lesson. Actually, for those who are listening and don't know the answer, but Rabbi Foreman is explaining that it's it was something that was really out of her reach in terms of what her uh, place in. She was commanded by her, you know, father, she's the daughter of of Paro, going to save a Hebrew baby, and. She has all her maidservants around her. Undoubtedly, the maidservants are telling her, you know, this is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, they're probably in her ear telling her how this is like, you know, crazy to go save it. So by the Midrash saying that, you know, she couldn't reach the basket. So so the, 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 the basket, so her hand magically reached forward. What it's trying to say was it took a miracle for her to actually want to take Moshe right. into mm -hmm. The palace. Yeah, and you miss, and you that's miss how Robert Foreman brings it. By the way, that's a very powerful lesson. That's like a very, it's a great sermon. You know what Correct. I mean? Like, yeah, but you can't oh, get there if you're just yeah. reading it. Yeah, you see that's Yeah, okay. So. But the question is, you know, I, I once, um, the question is how we can broaden the curriculum. And one way of broadening the curriculum is to raise up rabbis who were scholars in other areas other than you know, Shas and Poskib. So one of my one of my friends, my colleagues, my friend Rabbi Nadi Halfgut years ago said that if you go to any yeshiva and you look at the pictures of the great Russian yeshivas, who are they? Now they're all Gedolim. But do you see any Bali Machshava up there? Do you see any philosophers? Do you see any, you know, even experts on Tanakh? What you're gonna see are people who were masters at Shas and Poskib. And that's great. They should be up there. But but why don't we have pictures up there of rabbis that were could learn Gemara, but that's not really what they were known for. That wasn't their major intellectual contribution. 
right? The fact that they're not even up there. Right. Why, why aren't there no pictures of the Ramchal? Why are there no pictures of, I don't know, of Kreskis, of Albo, of, of, of these great medieval Jewish philosophers? Because they're, it's not seen as, as important. And if we, I don't know, if we don't push, I don't even know who we need to push. And maybe it's the principles, but the curriculum has just remained the same for too long. And again, I'm not advocating removing Gemara, Mishnah. I just, we need to have more choices. So I people, think it's, yeah. I think it's a travesty that Christians know Tanakh better than the Jews do, yeah. for the most part. I mean, maybe not in Hebrew, but like we're not teaching Mikra to children. We're not, we're not, from a young age, we should have a, a, the full gamut of, of uh, Tanakh knowledge. We we have to be able to open the Chumash and be able to understand it on our own by the age of 10 or 12. The, the fact that yeshiva kids are graduating and they can barely even speak Hebrew is a problem. It's a problem because... So, so my, let me ask you guys, though, because there is an issue. I taught for a couple of years. Um, I taught in Ramaz, Jewish day school in the Upper East Side. Um, I substituted a little years ago at, at Frisch. When I was in those schools, you realize it's like it's triage. These kids are not terribly focused. They're high school kids or elementary school. You have them for a couple of hours. And the question is, what do you do with them during that time? And how much, because that whole Ivrit Ivrit thing, I mean, in principle, I agree with you. But let me ask you a question. Would you give up somebody having a deeper understanding of God and the basics of Judaism, of Jewish philosophy, but now they can, they they're, they're, but their Hebrew is good? Like, because... I don't know if you can get both unless you're going to spend more time on Hebrew and Torah studies and less time on secular studies. And the modern Orthodox day schools, they split it up. It's like half and half. My three boys went to Yeshiva Katana, which is a little more of a Yeshiva school. They didn't start English studies till 2.30. So they were learning every morning from 9 to 2.30 every day. And then they continued into, you know, MTA and then YU. So their Torah knowledge is is much greater. Your typical modern Orthodox day school kid only has a few hours. Are you going to take it up with the Hebrew? That's the question. Well, I, I, I'll, I can answer that from as a yeah. Sephardi, um, because what we really focus on in our communities is more on on understand how to read Mikra and Ta'amim, teaching our children. All the kids have to learn Ta'amim. And what happens is that Kids are going up for maftir when they're six years old and all that. Yeah. And what that does is that nobody ever feels left out when they're older. They can read a siddur. Everybody can come into a shul. When they feel out of place, they you know what they can they open know how to open the siddur and, and catch up. And the thing is, and you'll see a difference between the Sephardic communities and the Ashkenazi communities. We, you know, there's a joke that when we had Rabbi Mark Angel on, he he made a joke. He said, um, you know, when two Ashkenazis get into a fight, they open three shuls. <laughs> You know, and you have all these denominations and, you know, you, you can't ask these questions. Don't talk to those people. Don't marry into that community. We, I sit in a shul. The guy to the left of me drives to shul on Shabbat. The guy to the right of me wears a black hat. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we all pray together. We have, we, we can disagree. We can get into a lot of, you know, deep conversations and, and disagree tremendously, but we're, you know, it's, we're friends. Everything's fine. Why? What, what is, what is the reason behind that? It's the culture. It's the culture. The culture that you won't find a find me a Sephardic reform synagogue anywhere. Won't exist. And that, right, but you're not gonna you're not gonna change that because that goes back to that goes back to the Enlightenment already. Ashkenazic Jews were exposed to the Enlightenment in a way that many Sephardic, not all, in a way that many Sephardic Jews were not, and therefore our faith is a little more. We're a little more skeptical. I don't know if the Enlightenment, because, for example, I find that the the Golden Age, which was the, the age in Spain, where all most of the great commentators on the Torah were Sephardim, mm -hmm. right? And and they were very much exposed to the pre-Enlightenment wisdom of the world, probably even more sophisticated right. wisdom, Aristotle, time. Plato, yeah, yeah. all that stuff is, in my opinion, way more sophisticated in many ways. It's but still it wasn't as anti-religious as the Enlightenment was. The anti-Enlightenment was focus on rationalism but rationalism I, I, I don't know about that so much I, I definitely think that it it uh it forced Judaism to kind of look itself in the mirror and and uh recalibrate um mm -hmm. I, it, so in in a sense it, it well it pushed out it pushed out books like the Moran of Uchim. it forced certain rabbis to have to reconcile you know Torah wisdom this is before the enlightenment the, the Moran of Uchim, but 
but you know, having to reconcile, you know, once Jews came into, in, in, you know, encountered Greek philosophy, they would, they're like, oh, this is impressive, this is interesting. A rabbi like the Rambam needs to write what's consistent with Judaism, what's not consistent with Judaism, and make a case for the sophistication of Judaism, because if you're not well educated, it's going to look foolish. You see, that's what happens with the other 80%, my population, of young Jewish professionals who are very sophisticated intellectually in their careers. They're lawyers, doctors, PhDs, and they have a fifth grade understanding of Torah. What do you think Torah looks like to them? Looks childish? Yeah, exactly. Silly. It doesn't look like a compelling, forceful life. Why would I ever consult it for true wisdom? I'm going to go to the real intellectuals in the world. Right. And and what we haven't discussed, actually, is like we're, we're living in like self-contained communities. Um, and I would say, like, for example, the, the guy who got, who's brought towards, you know, brought closer to Torah, who lives in Passaic, New Jersey, he, he can kind of succeed. But let's say the guy in the UK... Um, what happens after Kirov is done? And he he's not prepared for, you know, what it's like to be now married as a guy and having children and saying to Yeshiva. He is entering a world which he never fully was ready for. And um, I feel like that... And, and that has to do with inspiration. Yes. That's Keeping the that problem inspiration. with inspiration. The problem with inspiration is, is that at a certain point, life hits you hard and... I feel like a lot of times uh, the Rabbanim that might provide the inspiration don't know how to um, give them a longevity to go with that or mm -hmm. for it to face every single battle that comes in yeah. life afterwards. Yeah. It's a problem. And, and Kabbalah, um, now that we're on the, we were talking about rationalism, the issue with Kabbalah is that it's not rigorous. It's very abstract. It doesn't, there like it often leads to breakaway movements that a lot of the, you know, false messianism and whatever other movements you could think of that go completely haywire, uh, they're coming from more um, mystically inclined schools, you know? So, so that approach, I feel like is not, it's, it's very abstract. The reason why I believe the Balatanya and and the Ari and the Ari and uh, Ramchal were very successful and have been. They were right. systematic, exactly like the Rambam. They they applied a rationalist approach to these ideas. The reason why we mentioned Rabbi Weinberger off camera, but mm -hmm. but Rabbi, he's he's successful for that same reason because he's a neo chassid. He created a new kind of uh, uh, approach, which is you know a rational approach to. Yeah, I, I think um, even though Chabad doesn't have a reputation, the more I study Tanya and the writings of Chabad literature, the more of a system you see. It is really a system. It's organized. People just want organization. People desire rationality. The truth of the matter is, even the atheists and the agnostics and the skeptics, they just want rationality. That's what they desire. So if we approach religion um, in a way where it's like, the same superstitious nonsense and the same wacky ideas that just don't appeal to human the human desire of our generation. People desire rational thought, even the in the in the. I'm telling you, I mean, for my own experience, I see. Right, people... he, he, you're not. He's not saying that inspiration is not important. He's right. saying that let it be kind of structured within a rational frame, framework. 100%, 100%. The question is, you know, you guys mentioned before, what happens to someone when they uh, encounter, God forbid, suffering or a difficult life situation, and all they had was inspiration. They had a lot of fluff. And that is not going to withstand the test of time. It's not going to, I agree. And that happens uh, sometimes in the Balchuva Kirov world, where, where someone was really inspired to become observant, but didn't really fill their bellies with enough of the meat and potatoes of Judaism. And, 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 and it's not like a system. It's more just like a little hodgepodge here and there. Then so God, forbid something goes wrong. Yes. And they don't know what's going I, I've on. seen this time and again, time and again, and, and, it time happens, and, again. and it happens by the way with from people as well, because even if you had 12 years of Yeshiva day school, you may not have gotten a system as you're saying of Torah of how things work out and why, like we were talking about last night. Foundational, foundations. Foundations, that's foundations. fundamentals. Fundamentals, yeah.
Go ahead. Now, the one thing that a, an FFB will have over a BT, you know, someone who was raised religious will at least have, they got a little something more in their kishkas. You know what I'm saying? That they could draw on. They have that reservoir of just like being born with it. Now, it's not, I, I get calls all the time from parents. Would you meet with my son? Would you meet with my daughter? Can we get them involved in MGE? Uh, because they're no longer observant. They're no longer interested. And I've spent a lot of time talking to such individuals. And it's it's difficult because they have a lot of knowledge. But going back to our earlier part of the conversation, a lot of that knowledge did not really focus and center around the fundamentals of Exactly. That's, that's what we're saying. That's, that's what we're advocating that's for. That's exactly what we're saying. Yeah. You know, and it's, and it's, um, so somebody asked me, like, what would you do about, I think there was a Pew study that came out. Um, at the Pew study actually said that 67% of um, individuals who previously identified as Orthodox after a certain age no longer identified as Orthodox. How much? Uh, oh, oh, excuse me, only 67% positively continue to identify, which means 33% did not. That's a lot. That's 30. That's a third. That's, that's a, a lot. That's a huge number. Now, you know, I, I didn't see this study. By the way, there's a lot of them in the closet. We know from the Haredi and Hasidic world, right. you, they don't want to leave their bubble. But I knew a lot of kids in MTA growing up, were, like uh, in high school, that they were in so can, Muncie and at, in their home, the families weren't keeping anything, but in shul, they were wearing the black hats. So you can Tons safely say probably 50% to 50 Oh, yeah. If you include the ones that aren't saying it. but uh, are. You know, they have this expression, you know, tuna bagel. Have you heard of that? <laughs> <laughs> you familiar? <laughs> Wait, are you laughing because it sounds funny or you know yeah, what I'm talking about? Exactly. <laughs> well, what's so funny? What's the, what's the expression? The tuna bagel is someone from the Hasidic Shevelt, and I'm, I'm not trying to make fun, it's actually sad, who um, really sort of leaves Yiddishkeit, and you can't really tell that they're Hasid except when they order a tuna bagel because it sounds like the Hasidic accent comes out as a tuna, ah, tuna, tuna bagel, tuna bagel, <laughs> something like that. Now, uh, I'm not dealing with that population as much. Um, I, so I don't really know. I don't pretend to know the Haredi world as well. How, what's the drop-off? I don't know. I'm sure we, we get some of those people. We get the host religious ex-Haredim, ex hasidim who reach out and be like, wow, we didn't even know this kind of a, this Judaism exists, that there's like a... Because they still want to have a connection. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, modern orthodoxy could be a great you know kind of world for that for for those individuals to kind of enter because a lot of them are not really opposed to the values and principles and ideas of torah they just don't like the insularity or the court you know the it's a very controlled small world they just need to spread their wings a little more and not but it's but what i see is a lot of yeshiva jewish day school 12 years of jewish day school maybe even a year or two in israel and then just kind of um, flaking out. Right. I lived on the Upper West Side um, for many, many years. And you have a, a decent population, unfortunately, of amazing young Jewish professionals who grew up going to Yeshiva Day School who, um, who unfortunately, um, are, are no longer observant. And the question is, what's happening? Why is that happening? Now, for some, it's, a, it's, it's just a product of not having found the right person. Very hard to stay from and single for too long. Yeah, we all know that this was made ideally for the family, and it's just very, very difficult, especially if a lot of your friends are married and you're not. And so that's not really a philosophical. Um, the only thing we can do about that is try to be a little more proactive about fixing people up. The other issue I think that's more, you know, pertinent to why you guys started this uh, podcast is is that they were never really given enough of a philosophical foundation yes. for Torah so that when they're in the secular world and a lot of things are very appealing about the secular world and I don't just mean physical like taivas and, and, and desires but intellectually, intellectually, yeah. intellectually and their intellectual understanding of they have a decent handle on halacha they know what you can do what you can't do but they don't really have a sophisticated understanding of the setup of 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 Judaism and how it actually has answers to 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 difficult problems and questions like why bad things happen to good people and so on and so forth. They've never sat in on a class on that after all those years. Yeah, and I think so, also you know, for example, we we recently had uh, Hanukkah, 
and the appeal of of uh, Hellenism mm -hmm. was that Jews for the first time were, were I heard this from Rabbi Joseph Dweck. He said something very beautiful. He was saying for the first time in history, Jewish people were were exposed to uh, a threat that was not like a an idol or sticks and stones. It was in an, it sh it was proof that there was an intelligence that can basically reach almost the same type of wisdom of Torah wisdom it rivals or, rivals it, and it comes with a lot more, less uh, pressure, a lot less um, difficulty, and you can have yeah, there's no uh, there's no there's no there's demand no obligation. on your person right. no obligation exactly and and then also they, they were pressuring the Jews started pressuring the priests and the leaders to become Hellenized, and how 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 you know th this is a problem that I see with the religious world today is that especially in the more Haredi Haredi like communities is that they'll they really avoid um, for example. Sending All their kids to university, the contact with the world. Yeah. Why? Because I believe it's out of fear of being exposed to certain ideas. They don't want smartphones. Why? Because people might look things up. They say it's about pornography, but a lot of times it's about getting access to, to information. I fully agree with you on that. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's about information. It's about information. And sure. What, sure. What, what, what I feel is that we've had, for example, Rabbi Joshua Berman, Dr. Joshua Berman, who was on discussing biblical criticism. This is something we should be teaching our children. His book, Anima Amin, should be owned by every Orthodox Jew to understand how to combat this threat of biblical criticism. And Umberto Casuto and, and people like that, who nobody talks about in the yeshiva world. It's unbelievable. This is, he gave you a weapon to fight back with, and we're not using it. It's, it's mind boggling. And the one thing I wanted to say just to bring back to your point originally before with, um, you know, how to approach Kiruv, um, I feel like the Torah kind of tells, the Tanakh tells us this. With Eliyahu Hanavi, he is kind of a, um, mm -hmm. if you guys who are listening, you can go back to our episode with Rabbi Alex Israel. And we talked about Eliyahu Hanavi, was, is he a cautionary tale or a hero? Because it seems as if he's a cautionary tale. He's a cautionary tale because of the fact that he's constantly being um theatrical with his uh, fire and brimstone fire and brimstone which is like a very by the way today the fire and brimstone rabbis tend oh. to be sfardi who try to you know use fear and they're the you know black hat sephardim who try to bring fear uh do cure through fear and it says clearly in the tanakh that this is not effective um Hashem Hashem, you Hashem you Hashem and he says um mm -hmm. you have to use a cold a soft still voice steady it means give them the foundations, give, be patient with them, work with them. Don't be harsh. Don't be, you know, don't be so uh, don't hang unforgiving. Hell. Don't hang hell over their heads. Exactly. That's not what it's about. So, so yeah, you know, I mean. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, you know, I just wonder, I'm also a realist though, like, and, and um, I'm a big advocate of a much more soft approach. And when I say soft, I don't mean fluffy, you know, to give people substance, to give people, you know, and 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 people are invested with free will. They're going to do what they whatever they're going to do anyway. You know, but at least you're arming people with information, with wisdom to make a, an informed decision. I don't think even our yeshiva graduates, you know, we uh, you know go back to that word you used earlier, are you know who are abandoning. I, I don't even know if we can say they're really abandoning because they were never also exposed to some of the greater profundity, wisdom, and philosophy of Torah whether it's the more esoteric aspects of Torah, like Kabbalah and Chassidut, or it's the more rational, Maimodian types of Torah, you know, and then somebody goes off the derech and we're all upset with them. <clears throat> but they they didn't, they weren't really given, in my opinion. Now, but at the same time, just one thing, I'm a practical person. How much can you be exposed, right? How much can you be exposed to the secular world and stay true to Judaism? Because even if you have a very good, philosophical foundation um, i mean i'm not a huge advocate of of sending our kids off to colleges wherever they are even if there's a hillel or a wonderful chabad on campus i feel for two reasons that politics. It's, it's a lot of the politics though That's whatever the... whatever it is uh, it's not just the politics you guys are more intellectually driven a lot of people are not so intellectually driven it's just it, it <laughs> the temptations of just eventually just hanging out and going to bars and hanging out with other friends who are not religious or who used to be religious and are hanging out in bars Friday night, you have to be very strong and really tied into 
your community in order to not do that and 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 continue to be careful about looking for hashkachas for foods when a lot of people are not doing that. It just slides. The uh, second reason I'm not in favor is because I feel like those years should be spent growing intellectually in terms of Torah. And your best case scenario on college campus is maybe an hour or two chavruta a day. You compare that to a typical guy learning up at YU. I'm not saying YU is the end all and be all, but they're learning from nine in the morning till two in the afternoon, sometimes three, and they have chavrutas at night. And you have the great Rashi Shiva walking around. You can't really compare that to somebody who's going to a secular college, even if they end up going to Minyan every day and maybe you know, squeezing out an hour a day of learning. They're like the big tzaddikim on campus. Hmm. And um, so even though I'm very into Torah Umada and I'm very into taking on these challenges and not being afraid and, 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 and arming ourselves with the intellectual ammunition to be able to confront these intellectual challenges, you got to know yourself. And you got to know what your kids and your friends can handle, because even if you're armed with all that, three, four years, the whole thing could unravel. Now, I'm not saying why you is for everyone, and I'm not saying that doesn't happen anyway in other environments. Right. But it's more the exception. It's more the exception than the rule. I think. I think in the Orthodox community, you know, I, I think unfortunately we're losing a lot of our kids because of those three, those four years on college campus. I do. I'm not saying it's the whole reason. I think you, we've been discussing what's been missing from their education when they were younger. But I would argue that even if their education had those fundamental philosophical um, uh, foundations, I would argue that it's still difficult to stay. Well, we won't We won't really know because it hasn't been done. That's the thing. Even rational, a rationalist approach to Kiruv hasn't been done. You 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 kind of have to dance around the issue like if you say anything that's like perceived as anti kabbalah in in most environments you, you kind of have to like hide because you know you're you get threatened you get you know people who you know, i'm being serious like it's it, true it's true yeah you have to hide you have to what book are you reading you know like you're like it's kfira it's this and that so it's it's never been tried. I'm saying that the Kirov approach. I don't know. I don't know what, it's funny. I don't know where you guys are hanging out because, like, in the worlds that I operate, um, I don't know. People are pretty open. I don't mean just in terms of my outreach population, you know, but in the modern Orthodox world, I think people are pretty open to hearing different ideas and not mocking a different perspective. That's been my experience. I don't know. Maybe you guys are having yeah, a little different, di different, definitely different experience. experience. Is a little bit different. Yeah. But but to hearken to what you said, I I. I do agree that there always needs to be a balance. Balance is always key. You can't go too far one way or the other. If the problem in the Orthodox communities is that they are so insular that it becomes it's 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 like it, it they are shadowed from the world, and that is no good. And I agree with you, okay, that there that if you go too much to the other side, there's a lot of danger with that. In fact, referencing back to Alex Israel in the podcast we had for Sefer Melachim that we did with him, that's how he explained Shlomo Melech's uh, downfall. Right. At the end of the day, as great as he was, he exposed himself too much to the other to 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 the to the outer world, and it you know what happened happened. He fell. So I agree with you. I, I think that personally, at least, I I think that balance is key. And I think that we have to keep a, a Jewish environment around. And, and you, the can't answers... just, you can't just abandon that. But I do think that it's not even about being able to go out and arm yourself with, with you know, oh, I have the answers to everything. It's not. I think that it's about when you have, by, by having the fundamentals, by having the foundations, you're able to be more balanced. I'm not saying that you need to be right. all the way to the right. other side, but 100%. you don't have to be closed off either. Right. You, you will I'm always, you will always have to protect yourself and your children from everything if they don't have a solid a Jew Jewish education. And and I think what we're saying together now is a solid Jewish education is a basic understanding of the philosophical foundations of Torah. And if you don't have that. You're right. Then you're you're susceptible to I don't even know what acculturation, assimilation. Um, you know, you're you're, you're gonna, but like I, I think what's very very powerful that what you said about Shlomo Melech because you know even the greatest of greats you put yourself into. I remember I you know I um, I'm a scholar in residence in some of these hotels for Pesach, so I get into these conversations always 
It's like a big modern Orthodox group, and it tends to be a little more on the modern of the modern Orthodox community. And a lot of the parents will say to me when when they hear me speaking against going to secular college, they will say, I don't understand. I gave my son, my daughter, 12 years of Jewish day school. And some of them even sent their kids to Israel for a year or two. I said, you, you mean to tell me after all of that, they still have to be cocooned at Yeshiva University? <laughs> they can't. A they fair can't. point. <laughs> my, my answer to them is, is the same. I said, have you spent time on college campus? Have you felt the feeling on a Friday night when you have a, a lot of friends going out to the bar or like you mentioned before, the political divide between the left and the right now and the, and the wokeism and the kind of influence that a lot of young people have from their professors, not just from their peers, but their mentors. And you put that together and add one other thing to the equation. First time they're out. This is the first time that they're sort of like out of the little, you know, orthodox bubble in which they were raised. Now, everybody's different. One of my closest friends, you know, he didn't want to go to YU. And he, whatever, he's a very smart guy, went to Columbia. He did really well. Columbia was good for him. YU would not have been good for him. Hmm. But he was, I think, unique. And and I think, um, I think most people, even armed with the 12 years of day school, and I would argue even if we got that curriculum to be tweaked like the way we want to, I still think it would be putting your child in spiritual harm's way um, to, to expose them. That, that's my feeling. Uh, and I'm, by the way, I've, I'm a big advocate of Torah Mada, of, of studying secular studies and seeing how they converge with Torah, how they conflict and being able to tell the difference. I'm, I'm a student. I had a relationship, Baruch Hashem, with, with my, my teachers and mentors, Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, of blessed memory, who wrote the book on Torah Mada, my main mentor and teacher to this day is Rabbi Dr. Jacob J. Schachter. You should definitely get him on this podcast if you can. Uh, he, he's like a you know PhD in history from Harvard. Put in um, a good word for us, and <laughs> well, so like my other sort of intellectual mentors are Ravaren uh, Lichtenstein, Zechutzak Levrach, a PhD in English literature from Harvard. Rav Salavichik. They all tell me minds. these are Salavichik. great, great minds. So these are all great minds, and and they and they taught me and all of my teachers not to be afraid to study anything or to confront anything. But like you just said before, you got to know yourself. And you have. Do, do you realize that the probably the two most influential, let's say for example, today it's Rabbi Weinberger, and then before that was Lubavitcher Rebbe, um, and they were both college educated. <laughs> so it's 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 about like. That's why are they that's, that's an interesting why point. are they successful it's that is because that, and by the way in the case of rabbi weinberger i mean it really applies to the rebbe too and um he he's got so much at his fingertips because he sat by the rav he right. sat by himself and he went to yeshiva university so he has the nigla and he's got the nister so he's like able to draw from both and he's got that balance the rav had that the labavitch rebbe had that you know, and an appreciation and not looking at the secular world and secular wisdom. Ah, it's all shtus. It's all nonsense. They don't know what they're talking about. I think because the Torah tells us that, though. This is why it's important to, to really learn Torah very carefully. And before we even jump to, like you said, the meat and potatoes, I believe this is the meat and potatoes. Because for the, the story of, of Yosef is, and and he it's obviously juxtaposed with um, the story of, of Yehuda. There are two paradigms of leadership. And you, it, it almost seems as if the Torah is building us towards a, a Yosef who's going to be tempted by things, right? That he's he's immersing himself in, in the secular world and the non-Jewish world. Meanwhile, the one who actually succumbs to his temptations is Yehuda, not Yosef. <laughs> so the this it's not always the Torah has the answers to a lot of these things that you don't have to be afraid of approaching. The outside world you just have to like he mentioned balance you have to mm -hmm. understand how to do it and you need to have a foundation like the, when Chazal says that that they he was learning uh, halacha with his father Egla Rufa and all these things they're really trying to teach us that he had the fundamentals he, he had the fundamentals exactly Beautiful. and Yehuda Yehuda and, ran away and, and 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 he had you know the the, the Chazal, Chazal say they had the, the Mutyon Ko that he had this image of his father Yaakov that he brought everywhere with him 
Right, but listen, Yehuda and and they they both had different strengths and different weaknesses. You know, Yosef was not perfect either, even though the Torah calls him the tzad, you know, the Chazal call him the tzaddik. But uh, you got to know yourself, and and I think I don't think we're honest with ourselves. Uh, I I think, um, or we're just living in La La Land to think that oh, because I have this twelve years of yeshiva day school, I can put my kids in any, I can go anywhere and do anything, and I'll still remain committed. That's just not the reality. Uh, on the other hand, I also think it's going to backfire if you if you cut yourself and your children and your family off from some of the beautiful parts of the secular world that can only enhance your avodat Hashem. And, um, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be afraid. So, like, I know I'm saying it sounds it's a little... Balance. I think that I think it's about really knowing the person. Everyone has to know themselves and know their children and know... That... If there are certain people where you can tell, right, that they can strive, you know what I mean? And it's nothing to really worry about. And there's certain people where you can tell, you know what I mean? Like, no, this person, you need to you need to scale it back with them. You know what I mean? Balance, being able to see every situation individually, not just making a blanket statement about it. I think right. that's why it really depends on the kid. Uh, you really, that's what really I'm saying, yeah. But I think there's an emphasis also on emuna, like faith and... Faith is not a Jewish concept. It's a Christian concept. Even the term emunah in the Torah, vayiminu badonai Moshe Avdo, these are, this is about faithfulness, loyalty. Loyalty. Right? That's the translation that, That's the, the actual meaning of the word, meaning there is no idea of blind faith in the Torah. Um, even Avram Avinu with all these midrashim that talk about, you know, Avram jumped into the fiery furnace. Um, that, right, but that's after he already worked it out. So the yeah, reason, but now the, the, the Avram in the Torah is somebody who uses common sense. He lies twice about Sarah being his sister, and the and I believe my my understanding of the story of this midrash. I can, if you if you don't mind, I'll go a little bit into this midrash. I find it to be a very powerful midrash that is often misunderstood. Um, the Avram is from Ur. Ur actually means fire. Right. Mm -hmm. And when it says Abraham first broke all the, it's, he shattered all, for those who didn't hear this Midrash, Abraham is a young boy working in his father's uh, idol store and he shatters all the idols and he puts the uh, stick in the hand of the biggest idol. And then his father basically says, uh, what did you do? Um, he said, it wasn't me, it was the idol. And then he says, how can he do that? He's just a statue. So he says, let your ears hear what your mouth just said. Right. So it says his father takes him and and takes him to he takes him to Nimrod to be judged and Nimrod throws him in in the fiery furnace meaning Ur is fire right meaning he's indoctrinating him in the wisdom of Ur right and it's it follows by stating all of these things that he uses this argument this argument with Abraham back and forth, back and, forth uh, and it's it's actually teaching us negative theology which, which the Raman teaches about what God is not. God is, maybe God is the tree, so maybe worship the tree. No, maybe God is the clouds, or so maybe worship the clouds. It can't be the clouds because the wind blows away the clouds, and he uses all this reasoning to explain to him. And this is teaching us the process of Abraham's um, understanding of Hashem, the different stages of his development. And it says his brother, his brother was consumed by the fire, meaning his brother didn't come out of that indoctrination. Okay. He fully fell into Ur mentality, and he didn't come out of it. He came out of it, um, as 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 a you know burnt man, and whereas Abraham, he came out unscathed. But we see that from the practical sense in the Torah, he doesn't match this this blind faith kind of guy. He's actually somebody who who uses common sense. And right. the, the the reason why I bring this up is because the first commandment in in the Ten Commandments is to know Hashem, right? To knowledge of God, knowledge dot dot like Adam knew Eve, right? It's it's about intimacy, knowledge of God does not come only from the Torah. As the Rambam explains, it comes from any wisdom of the world, oh, right? mathematics, sure. science, all these things can bring us a deeper understanding. If people actually study what DNA is, that in itself would be like, wow, that's one of the biggest proofs of God. Yeah. You know, and these things can these things actually lead to inspiration. So I don't believe faith is something that is sustainable. Faith I, gets shattered. I, I, no, but the the only thing I would I first of all you explained that Medrash beautifully and that I I um I want to share this with my students. I love the whole or thing. I think that's really oh, it's clever. Thank you. Right, and, and it really does justice to the to the whole story and the text and the medrash. You know, the only thing I would I would add or maybe refine a bit is is to say that like I also believe I don't believe in in blind faith, and I don't think Judaism subscribes to blind faith. I do believe that's more of a Christian idea. 
probably with the exception of Rav Nachman of Breslov and some extreme Hasidic um, kinds of views that really do believe, like no rationality. But the reality is, is that when we believe in rationality, I don't know if we believe, I mean, I know I, I don't believe that I can come to know something on a purely rational level fully, right? Meaning my rational um, cognitive powers can only bring me to believe in something until a, a, until a certain point, and then there is that there is that little gap between am I going to accept this or not, even though I don't hundred percent believe it, but it makes more sense to me. That's always my gauge. Does it make more sense than not? But making more sense than not is not hundred percent mm -hmm. because there's no hundred percent. Kant proved that in his famous work, you know, the critique of reason, that it's impossible to really know anything a hundred percent. Now, that doesn't mean the other extreme. That doesn't mean we go to the other extreme and say, oh, blind faith. No, that's nonsense. You can know something to a large degree. You just can't know it fully. And that's where that's where Imuna comes in. Faith right. is that, faith is that, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's 10%, I don't know how to quantify it. But let's say believing in God or believing the Torah comes from God. And I can demonstrate rationally that there is a God, ad kach, rationally that God wrote the Torah, ad kach. But that's not going to take me a hundred percent. I still have to. I still have that. I, I got to make a. I, there's some leap. There's always some leap. Well, the Hashem is actually the unknown no, knower, right? We, we can't know Him. But the first commandment is to know God. The first of the ten commandments is to know God. So there's a paradox there. But the idea is, is that we have different levels of when we develop. We have a new understand. When we have a new understanding of God, we have a new relationship with God, and this this the journey is the goal. It's the constant refinement of understanding of Hashem. There's a refinement that goes on that needs to continue to be built off of, and we're never going to fully have the answer. Just like Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't have the answer. What do you do? What what what, what gets you from wherever your brain can take you in terms of let's say knowing God or His existence or His unity, His oneness, whatever the belief is? What gets you from where your brain stops? So. Yeah, so I'll tell you. I'll tell you what it is. I think it's evidence. I'll tell you it's it's evidence, and it's it's understanding the. If you have enough evidence, then you can take that, like you said, a leap. But yeah. it's not really a leap because it's more about intuition. Um, it's the same thing where where when you go on a date with a woman, right? You're not having a. If you really have a connection to the girl you're dating, which Hashem, we're always comparing our relationship to God as like kind of like a, a, a dating, right? Like a marriage. Sure, sure. Um, right. So, so when you know that this person is the one, um, you don't need to know every single detail about her life. You're gonna find it out as you're dating you, her, as you're married you say, to her. And when you say you actually know that this person is the one, okay? If we yes. would drill down and we would put a number on it, mm. what, what does that mean? You know, hundred percent. Well, at a certain point, you know 100%, right? Even though you don't know her, though. Even though you fully don't know her, you don't know oral tendencies, you don't know if she leaves a toothpaste in the you know, in the, in the sink and all these things. You don't know those little qualities, but it doesn't matter because you know enough. You know that... enough, but you don't know 100%. Right. right but but he... So yeah. that's, that's my point. When you get to that place, what brings you from 80%, 70% to, the, to, to just going with it? You, you guys yeah, aren't arguing. Arguing. Yeah, we're not arguing. You guys aren't arguing. You guys we're, are we're using we're topic. using the same we're using the same idea but different terms. You're you're saying it as a leap of faith, and I'm saying it as intuition. I'm saying that you built enough of a structure, a framework, um, of of, of where commitment of, makes sense of commitment faithfulness, sense. faithfulness where it makes sense. Commitment makes and sense. And it's about loyalty to that, then, to that to that to that understanding. I like the way you said commitment doesn't commitment makes sense, but it hasn't been proven a hundred percent. Sure. So, you know, the story I like to tell, to share, I've shared this so many times, and my wife hates it, but um, it's a friend of mine. So he was, he's been married for many, many years, and he had the zechus of Rabbi Salvechik being the Masada Kedushin, the officiant at his wedding. And right before he walked down the aisle, the Rav took him aside, and he said, are you sure? <laughs> by the way, amazing. You really by the way it's a that? terrible question to ask. <laughs> oh my god, a terrible question to ask the groom. And he was like, he froze. First of all, he was just like intimidated in front of Rabbi Salvechik. So he was just like standing there. And the Rav said back to him, Good, only a fool could be sure. Now, what did the Rav mean? Did the Rav mean, amazing. Oh, just close your eyes and marry anyone, blind faith? No, he was very much in love with his wife and he spoke about their special relationship. and 
But the idea of absolute certainty, when it comes to these questions of love, relationships, or or God, or or anything in the world, even the world of mathematics and science, are not based on one hundred percent prove. Exactly. Proven, you know, Rabbi evidence. Sachs' famous quote. What's the Rabbi Sachs' famous quote? Uncertainty, faith, and certainty. Um, are you talking about doubt? Doubt. Yeah. Same thing. Um, he says uh, basically that. Um, doubt is the courage to live with uncertainty. No, faith, faith is the is the faith is the courage, oh, courage to live with faith. uncertainty. Yeah, exactly. Rabbi yeah. Sachs is saying exactly what you're saying. Oh, I gotta write that like that. Faith is the courage, courage to, to live, live with uncertainty. Yeah. See, oh, he's because, talking about that twenty percent that you're talking about. Yeah, That's and, what he's talking about. And, and Rabbi Lamb, you should read this. He wrote a book called Faith and Doubt, and he I have it. it. You have it. it right. And he explains the role of doubt in faith because, I mean, this was all done purposely, we believe. The, the Bore Olam created us with great intellectual prowess and ability, but not absolute. And, and you know, the, I always say this also as an attorney, do we ever demand the prosecution to prove 100% that the person accused of committing the crime, that the defendant is 100%? It doesn't. What's the highest standard of proof in this country to convict someone of a capital crime such that they would actually get the death penalty in Texas and other such states? What is it? It's beyond um, beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable, reasonable doubt. doubt. There's majority. There's preponderance of evidence. There's like three or four levels. Beyond the reasonable doubt is the highest one. Mm. So which means that if you can convince a jury, a jury beyond the reasonable doubt that A killed B, we are willing to take that person's life, even though beyond a reasonable doubt is not, not proof, is not one hundred percent evidence. It's not, yeah. but because but that's the reality. And yes, it's a problem. Also, with atheism, atheists have the same problem. It's, it's a leap. They're taking a huge leap of faith because what what are, there's a chance that there's a fifty percent chance at least that that there's a god, right? In 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 terms, of, if we're talking uh, statistics, they can't disprove God yeah, exactly. So they're also having faith in right, we're in all, the fact we're that all, he's not there. <laughs> in a sentence but but what i say to that i'm actually writing about this and i'm writing a basic judaism book um uh for for corin right now for corn publishers and so oh, in, my, in my in my chapter on god you know what i'm what i'm arguing is that some people would say well you can't prove it god and you can't disprove it so it's just faith either you're a believer in god or you're not a believer in god because after all it can't be proven one way or the other that's true, but that doesn't mean your alternative that's left is simply believe or not. What you do is you try to look at the evidence, look at the facts. I think that science and nature is something that needs to be looked at, and Jewish history needs to be looked at. Those are external factors, and I think there's mystical internal factors. You look at that and ask yourself, okay, what makes more sense? It's true, I can't prove 100% one way or the other, but what makes more sense? Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that's how I teach faith to my students. To believe in, in God, I think, makes more sense. It explains more of the issues that are out there. It accounts for more of the variables than atheism does, in my opinion. In my opinion. And I, I just want to backtrack yeah. because a lot was said, but there was something that was in my mind while you guys were going back and forth. I think that one thing that Benji uh, it, it was trying to, he was kind of going there, but then he went somewhere else. But one of the things that, um, one of the problems with uh, the lack of secular education in the Orthodox world and is that our connection to God, if it's strictly mystical, it's essentially all in the imagination. We are not, we, it, there's nothing actually there. You're not, meaning, if we take the Rambam at, if we take the Rambam seriously, and we understand that God is unknowable, right? Then the only way we can really come closer to God is by studying creation. Creation is the window to understand the wisdom of God, right? By taking out secular studies, by making everything secular to be like off limits, your conception of God becomes completely. Based yes. on the imagination, yes. you have nothing to really understand God with except a lot of mystical jargon that 
from from when they're young, they don't even know how to process or what to make of it. Yeah. I'm not saying that the Mikubalim didn't have yeah. deep, deep ideas. I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But these, this is going on to a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old. They're, they have no idea how to process right. these things. It's, it, and it's bordering um, idolatrous thought because it also sits in, it's, it's in the seat of the imagination. It's all yes. in the imagination. But, but what, I think, I think I, but I think a lot of these Mikubalim, they had a very good understanding of what was happening. At least I, I what we know in terms of science and and technology. No, no, no. I know that. I know that. The, I'm not talking. I'm not speaking about the Mikubalim. I'm speaking about the people today. Yeah, yeah. And how the way they're they're processing. They're it, not supposed to be learning these things. This is not what they're supposed to be learning because at 15 the, years old. Here's the problem: they're if, supposed let, to be able to. They're supposed to be learning yeah. about the world. So that they can process the world here, properly. Here, here's the problem, and thereby gain a, a greater insight into God's wisdom. Yeah, I want. I, I I think it's yeah. important in terms of bridging gaps. We knew, like you know, reaching out to you that we're going to have differences of opinion, mm-hmm. and there's this like. There's it took this, us too long. It took us too long to get to that. It did. It did. And and but the thing <laughs> is, but what I think is really, and, and what you're doing, I feel like you're talking to everybody. And you had this event where you had a mystic internationalist. We need to have these conversations. This is what Jews want to hear because they don't realize that this that that there is this conflict, um, and it's been going on for for a long time, and they don't realize that you know we we're doing this l'shem shemai. We care. We want. We're not. We're not saying that oh these people are bad and we're right and you're wrong. We're saying that we need to have a refinement of of what you know the foundations are and what, what is important to learn. And we also need to have the conversations that are not being had in yeshiva. If a person hears both point of views and he agrees with yours, but he heard both points of views, right. he agrees He agrees with yours. Fantastic. He made a real choice. My problem is, is that people are not even given that choice. They are mm. taught that this is it. There mm. is no other way, right? And rationalism is usually put into a very negative light. In your in your world, in you our have, world, okay. in, my, <laughs> in my world, in my world, it was almost just the opposite. You were looked it's at very as, interesting. As we, yeah, it really interest. It is really interesting because in my Ashkenazi modern Orthodox Yeshiva University bubble, in which I was raised, okay, you know, you are. I wouldn't say so as much today, but at least my, you know, you were kind of like. You know, a little weird. You were a little weird, and if you subscribe, to any of these, Kabbalah was always like a, it, it, and and it was always and it was swept under the rug as like a very superficial, fluffy. The real Talmud Chacham is the is is the rabbi who knows. Shas Halacha Poskin, we shown him could say a briska Chakira, and that is a Talmud Chacham. But I don't know. I I just and by the way, for the listeners, uh, we're not saying like. Like we're not anti. For example, we learn Ramban, Nachmanides. We learn Ramchal. Oh, I right. love the Ramban. And I noticed that you have two, three separate Rambans in your bookshelf right now. Uh, <laughs> so you, you're probably really into him too. <laughs> yeah, he, he um, he, listen, he was fascinating because, and I absolutely love this when they were burning the Rambam's svarim. He, who came to the Rambam's defense? The, the Ramban. Ramban. The Ramban. What is that show, by the way? What is that show? That even though they disagreed vehemently on certain core issues, the Ramban understood what a light, what a luminary the Ramban was. He wrote the most. Anyone listening to this should go and Google the letter. It's called the letter to the rabbis to the French rabbis. We want to make a yes. podcast on that, God willing. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's something matter, we're, we're working on. It. Because what it shows is that someone can be steeped in a different kind of a hashkafic approach, but understand. That the other approach, because the Ram the Ramban also was a rationalist and also had a lot of these explanations. Was. Before he went to Sod, he would explain, you know, there are different ways of explaining the same thing. But he understood how important and pivotal the Rambam was, and and they shouldn't be burning his books because he's quoting Greek philosophers or because he codified all of Shas in, into the Mishnah Torah, whatever the reason they were against him, he was the one to come to his defense. And I find that very inspirational. And very I think nice. that. That's kind of the, um, uh, I think the attitude we should we should take. Now, if you have a philosophical problem with the other approach, like what you were articulating before, which I hear it, panentheism, you know, it could lead you to some ideas or, you know, um, the Red Bendel issue and all that. Those are real problems and issues. But I think, 
I think it's throwing out the baby with the bathwater, meaning that I think we have to acknowledge that some of these Kabbalistic ideas could take you in the wrong way, but then do it responsibly. Make sure you have the right kind of teacher. We we are advocating for that. We're not we're not saying like by the way, we're gonna have an episode hopefully in the near future with Rabbi Maruf dedicated to panentheism, going into the earlier sources and seeing if there is actually um, an idea like that. But what I wanted to actually say about what you said about Ramban, which is fascinating, which I find fascinating, in the disputation of Barcelona with Pablo mm -hmm. Cristiani, he actually only uses rational, rational argument. Why? Why? Because that's, because that's not going to be, I mean, I don't know. You, let me hear what you I, I, I'll tell you. I, what I think is, you know, Kal Homer is that if you're going to argue against the Trinity, don't introduce the spherot. Meaning, really, really, because you're <laughs> opening a Pandora's That's box. So mean, man. I know, but but you're opening a Pandora's box. You see it today if you read Jews for Jesus website. Um, all of their art, most of their arguments against, um, you know, to prove that you know Jesus is actually, you know, uh, no, you're not going to use Kabbalah. They're always using Kabbalah, you know. Yeah, because the Trinity or, believes that God is one, but you know, yeah, the triune God, God and three. Yeah. yeah, but that yeah. doesn't mean that they're right. Okay, it doesn't I, mean that the cab. That doesn't mean. Saying? Yeah, that doesn't mean They're that the cabalists. Kind of laying out. Right, it just has its. Pl it has its place, yeah. and uh, it just it opens Pandora's box. But it, it really just shows you the godless of the Ramban, the greatness of the Ramban. That he, that he was so well versed in in both areas of Nigla and Nistar, and he could, you know, he could put one yarmulke on, and and you know, I just I just think that's so powerful, and uh, I think. You know, I, I think Rabbi Weinberger has that to a certain degree, even though there's no question that he's leaning towards the Hasidic uh, way, but but he's had that background, and that's what we really need. You know, it comes back to what you were saying before. It's just about balance, of having this kind of balance and and not belonging or not or making sure that the community to which we belong does not ram one thing down our throat and say the other thing is nonsense. So what we actually want to do with you is, you know, our show is mostly uh, like rational leaning because we feel like the the rational voices really aren't given a platform in and, our world. In our world, <laughs> and 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 but but we we have not let's say not not you know we had David Bashev, Rabbi David Bashevkin on we've had uh, Rabbi Breidowitz on um, who are actually rational for their yeah. world yeah. Um, and you know what I feel is that the conversation we're having right now is going to hopefully kind of warm people up to the idea that you know we're going to explore what are they talking about oh oh he mentioned the zohar and he mentioned all these, let's look into that let's see what they're talking about you know what what can we do to kind of work together we have we're living in an amazing age where we can have podcasts with rabbis that we've never even met before in person and we can you know inspire other podcasts we can inspire other people to have these conversations i think it's i think it's very important for us to kind of stop putting these walls up within the religious world and not don't talk to this guy because he's, oh, don't talk to that. We need to all have a conversation because that's how we're going to influence. You know, if we're going to be quote unquote influencers, we need, we need it to trickle down to the people to, you know, like we don't have to be afraid to agree to disagree. On exactly. Fine. We're going to disagree. That's okay. You know what I mean? Like, all right, that's it. Okay, well, guys, I, I really appreciate this. This is a great, you're, you're, you're coming in with a very, very important mission and purpose. And I think, I mean, you have been to some degree already. I think you're going to continue to be successful because, because this is what's needed. We 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 have to engage the, the you know again both populations that we started talking about with the less affiliated. Mm -hmm. We're so excited about this. Okay, they are excited about this because they haven't been introduced to any of this, unfortunately. And then those who have been introduced, let's say, within the Orthodox world, to one or the other are being given the chance to actually have a rational, you know, open conversation about the pluses and minuses of these two different approaches and which is more authentically Jewish and which one really resonates with you if you believe they're both authentically, you know, you know, proper representations of Torah, you know. Yeah. So I give you guys a bracha to, uh, you should continue to be Marvitz Torah and you should continue to... Uh, Thank you. Thank just, you. And we really admire you and... We really admire you and your work, and uh, we we hope that you know the people who are listening and watching this can get involved in this conversation. And uh, and you know we want to engage with people. We want you to engage with people from our side and uh, and our people from your side. I hate to call it sides because really there's probably a, a lot of overlap. But I think that this is an important thing that that you're doing, 
And we essentially just want solutions. We want, we both want the same thing. Yeah. We want our children to love Torah and to not go off the derech, that's right? It. So that's really what it comes we down just to. Want Judaism. So what are, we're trying to figure out what's the way to do it. And there is no, maybe, maybe there isn't one way. There's no, you know, we got to kind of try things out. There's trial and error, right? Um, and hopefully, God willing, this can inspire, you know, people to take the next step. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's fine. This is so much fun. Yeah. yeah this is great. So you guys much. are awesome. You have Thank a great you. energy between the two of you also. It's oh, great. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. We really appreciate All right. that. Take thank care. you, Laila Tov. Once again, God willing. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Okay, it was a pleasure, guys.